So we grew up in, in London and then in Luton and we moved back here in 1979. My dad said if Margaret Thatcher wins the 1979 general election in England, we'd be moving back to Ireland. Uh, so my mum was from Monkstown Farm originally and my father was from Glasstool and they lived in a flat in Crossway Park in Dunleary. And uh, they had been on the housing list because this new area called Ballybrack was all being built between corporation and county council, purchase houses, whatever else. And they had applied for a house and that. I arrived in Ballybrack in 1978. Uh, I had originally come up from Dawkey, uh, lived in Dawkey for probably about nine or ten years. And then we got a house in Ballybrack in Glenhaven. I moved to Ballybrack in December 76, just before Christmas. We were so delighted to get the house that we moved in within a couple of days of Christmas. Yeah, I was the first yeah, to move in here. They weren't even finished, it wasn't even finished. We let me go in and have a look and all the rest, you know. Well, when we moved in, we moved into a building site. Basically, there was 150 houses being built in Cromlock Fields and we were 147. So we, we should have been the last ones, but the way it worked, the building went that way. So we moved into a building site. Housing was obviously a big, a big problem, and uh, the standard of housing was a huge problem. I suppose we can we can go back into um, the 19th century, really. Um, if we're looking at, at Dublin, people will be familiar with the likes of the Ivy Trust, for example. Um, Organisations like that who would have, have provided housing in Dunleary Rat right Down. Um, you would have had, for example, the Dublin Artisan Dwelling Artisans Dwelling Company building some houses in Glastool, what was Kingstown. Urban District Council uh, built some houses around 1904, 1905. So there were some small pieces of, of, of building happening. Um, they tended to be small. Um, they tended not really to be sufficient for the size of families at the time. What was a little bit of a game changer, and it's an interesting one, is um, after World War I, um, the Irish Sailors and Soldiers Land Trust was established. And its purpose was to provide housing for ex-servicemen, Irish, Irish ex-servicemen. They started building in the 1920s, um, set up here in 1922-24. And then um, by 1926, they'd already built a thousand houses. Um, there were some in Sally Noggin. Um, and these were obviously for ex-soldiers, but they were of a higher standard. So they tended to be bigger. They had gardens and um, they were, you know, built of more solid materials. Let's say that probably raised the bar a little bit, mm. you know, as to what um, social, social housing meant in, in the free state. Another interesting aspect of that in Dunleary Rat Down is that you often had in the 1920s, you often had ex-British Army servicemen living as neighbours beside ex-IRA soldiers mm. and knocking along as we do, as we do here in Dunleary Rat Down. So then we get to the, the establishment of the Free State. And it's very, very rapidly acknowledged that housing is a massive issue and that, um, and that new houses are needed. So in 1925, we have what was called the Dublin Civic Survey Report. Mm -hmm. um, and that recommended that the, um, the tenements and the inner city slums need to be cleared and that what the country needs to do is to embark on a, on a huge suburban uh, building project. But out here, um, what that means is we start to get um, new houses, uh, new areas identified uh, for new houses in, in areas like Sally Noggin, Ballybrack, Monkstown Farm. The key building time for Sally Noggin is the late 40s, you know, into the early, into the early 50s. Um, and 
the way these places, you know, move from estates and farmland into housing is very interesting in that uh, the acts of the time, the, the, the national legislation of the time, uh, enabled the local corporation to compulsorily um, uh, buy these um, um, former estates or what were becoming former estates. Um, so there were CPOs um, of large areas of land and in, um, so the corporation would have been dealing with um, large landowners plus you know, to mean smaller landowners as well, but but the the, the key pieces of of um, what of the land that were to become um, these new homes for people uh, tended to be bought by CPO. I was born in Lockenstown Hospital. I was the rest of the family, but I was looking back at my family history. It was only my father and his brother. My father was born in 1916. There's only records over there in the church for him. So it was obviously, I think they must have come to Barry back in 1915, 1916. My father was a gardener, first of all, in a lot of the houses on the place, and then he was a temporary postman, and then he eventually became postman, and retired from the postman, but was gardener in some of the big houses here. How do you back them was country? Because all you had was, all we knew was Dale View and around the shops. At the end of Dale View, where Oakton Park is now, that was all a farm, Duffy's farm, and we used to go and play in that. Done a farm across the road, Roaches Farm. So it was, it was really country, a country area. And down the uh, Shangana Road to Shank Hill, that was all farmland as well, packets of land. The, uh, the centre was Fennens, it was the butchers. But there was a hardware where the funeral home is, and the post office was where Campbell was. And on the other side, there was just there was a few houses there. There was a farm there, Shackleton's Farm was up the top. His farm was there, but the, the land he owned was where, where, where Ashlawn is. That was his farm, it was up around there. And the cows used to be brought in. The milk and parlour was on Church Road. Like the, the history of Ballybrack is, is uh, well, it's fascinating. I mean, we're, we're, we're looking like, this is a, one of the oldest maps that I could find of the area. It's going back to uh, 1837. Well, it's the old fair plan. This was the map that was drawn up by hand from the surveys when they went out to, the Ordnance Survey went out to survey for the, the famous yeah, six inch maps yeah, yeah. at that time. So this was what was used then to make the, the copper plate engravings that the published maps were printed from. But it's information on this map that sort of didn't end up on the, the, original, the final published maps. Yeah. And it, it kind of throws a lot of light on, on really what was going on at that particular time. So it's, a, it's really a snapshot of the whole area, Kalini Brack in 1837. And I suppose the most interesting thing really is that Ballybrack is at this junction here. And you see, it's just, it's a T-junction. Yeah. Uh, there's a church road coming down from Matthias' church, which was built in two years beforehand in 1835. And that ends at um, Military Road. And that was the road that led out to the, the beach. And again, it was just a, a dead end. It didn't go any further. And that was the road that was put in to service the, uh, the Martello Towers and the batteries. You got the Martello Tower number five then and Martello Tower number six up on Kalini Hill Road and the batteries down by the, the train station on the beach there. Yeah. So you can see just around the village area there, there's hardly any buildings even, which is incredible. Exactly. No, yeah. It, was, it yeah. was Sleepy Valley. Well, people who come here now, um, I mean, people who move into Ballybrack in the last 20, 30, even 40 years, like it's, 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 it's an extension of Dublin. And in the old days, like it, it wasn't just out the country, it was out in the wilds. Well, Bally Brack, we only grew up, I think, and only pumped part in the 1850s, 1860s, when the railway came out from Dublin. And they started building all the big houses here. And then they built the churches when the school, the school was last built. The school and the house were built at the same time, the priest's house were built at the same time. We went to school in the Columban Hall beside the church there. It was a national school. Uh, pretty eclectic school. Like your kids from Kalini, Cabantini, Shankill, a few from the Noggin, but the Bolton from Ballybrack. And from all different backgrounds. It was built about 1860, 1870. Nice here, nice small school. We played in the church grounds as a play area. Well, then we learned how we, now we learned plenty. It was a good school, it was really good at Irish and stuff. Most of those kids could speak Irish when they left national school. And probably lost that when they went to secondary school because they were starting to be taught grammar stuff where they, they used to do it naturally in Cola. And uh, then as the numbers got bigger, the girls moved down to the Club, up 
full length so the eye go in and then in the late 60s oh no the mid 60s the bill st john's school where it's mom to have a church road i don't know i think there was there was only dale view and dale view park so there about 80 houses that's all there was when we came to ballybrack there was one big local political issue and if you were going for election to the john leary borough council you, you had to promise to do something about this mm -hmm. uh, when you knocked on doors. And that was Dale View, which was a, a, it's a terrace of one story cottages. There's 20 cottages in the terrace. And that, that, was, uh, that was public housing built around 1900 when this public housing thing started. The sewerage system did not cover it. So what you had was that the, each of these cottages had a little garden at the back and mm -hmm. at the back of the garden there was a shed yeah, and that yeah. was the toilet. It, You're was, pretty. An out, it yeah. was an outdoor yeah. toilet, but it wasn't on the sewerage system. So what happened, there's a back lane there. So what happened there was the, the, the city, well, the township as it was then, would come around and would empty out the toilets, 20 toilets okay. through a hatch in the wall yeah, yeah. down the back lane. And what you have here <laughs> is the what in modern parlance is called the honey cart. At honey least, cart. At, at least in, in airports, it's called the honey cart. And that's a big, it's a tanker mm -hmm. on wheels, right. a, a vacuum tanker. And it was pulled by, there, this one was pulled by two horses. Normally they're pulled by one, but because of the, 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 the hills clients, the and, steep, yeah, yeah. steep slopes here, they were, they were pulled by two. You would have had, for the Fed Union, you would have had Murphy's shop, Mr. Murphy. And then the middle shop was Mrs. O'Dwyer, a news agent. And then there was the medical hall and the chemist. And beside that, I only remember um, the DIY in it. I remember my father and brother saying that's where Fenland's Butcher started off before they moved down to build their new shop. And then where the Chinese takeaway is there near centre, that was the uh, post office, Keynes. And beside that, there was Mr. Stanley, who sell anything from a needle to an anchor. One of these old shops, we never can hang out of the ceiling, just one light bulb going. But it, it was interesting, uh, Fenland's here, uh, just up the road, the butchers uh, had been here for a long time. And there's a lane going up the side of their place, they used to kill pigs and things up the back, do their own slaughtering. The pig escaped one day and it was the biggest event in the village for years. And uh, they also had a place up where the, where the, the cleaners are now, they, they took over that place uh, for a while and they made sausages in there. And Willie from Fenlands uh, invited me in one day to see the sausage making. Jesus Christ, it would put you off sausages for life. Um, the, the, the gut is threaded onto a pipe that where the meat's going to come out. And there's everything dumped into the big funnel. And buckets of blood and everything. It's, it's unbelievable. And then the stuff comes out and you're, you're like you're trying to put on a condom holding back, <laughs> holding back the stuff while, the, while the, meat, the meat forces it out. And then, of course, it's cut and you do the twist, 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 twist. And then you have this civilised... The Island end result, sausages, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sausages, you know. <laughs> I suppose the big cards would probably the publicans, the two publicans would be um, Mr. Scanlon in the Rambler's Rest and Mr. Gilson around here, or Mrs. Gilson in Rannet. In the 50s, when there was a tiny population here, those both pubs thrived. But, but both of those pubs were bona fide pubs, which basically have, the, have their roots in people traveling long distances. And, so that when pubs, pub, outside of pub hours, when people were traveling long distances, they could stop off at a bona fide pub yeah, yeah. and get a meal and a drink at and, any or, time or whatever. Such, yeah, yeah. So that, that thing became totally abused. So when the pubs were closed on Sunday uh, morning and stuff like that, um, these bona fide pubs, you could drink in those pubs with impunity if you came from more than three miles away, three, mi three yeah, miles yeah. was so. Uh, uh, Ballybrack is very conveniently situated between Dunleary and Bray. Right. In case you hadn't noticed, <laughs> but uh, they were they were great social centres mm -hmm. in the village. I remember I remember um, Kev, Kevin Scanlon here in the in, in the Ramblers at the time had a, a very attractive daughter, which I think tended to increase the custom. She was some some lady, and uh, Gilson's around in the I go in. I was pally with two of the lads there. Uh, Hugh Gilson, I think, probably died by the time I came. Mrs. Gilson was running it, and in the old days. Um, uh, Guinness used to be bottled either bottled around the place or bottled specifically for pubs and there used to be Guinness labels on the on, mm -hmm. on the bottles and there I, I have a, a cop, well I had it stuck on a thing now I can't take it out but um, a, a label from the yeah, I go in yeah, Hugh yeah. Gilson and 
proprietor, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. The history, like Mrs. Gilson, that probably is the backbone of uh, of the Igo. That's the person that keeps all that's been brought to mind. I would have never, I never met the lady, uh, but I heard so many talking about her. Like she must have been an extreme strong woman to rear the family in a business where it was actually when Valley Black would have been changed and then like a lot of people would have moved into the village that would have been from a different area there would have been a different culture at the time she would have had to clear out kind of there was lads making their stand as they say and uh, she was a woman on her own around a young family and smoked her cigarette ash and but uh, they were just big stories like how how strong she was with her uh, cigarette hash would start at the, she'd start from one end to the other and they'd be still there when she'd be pouring the point. You'd end up eating the point, eating the point years ago, I believe. Workman's Club was great for concerts and stuff like that. So that was what have been the or the snooper hall that was up at the Workman's Club. They used to have what they called um, what they call bingo now. It's housey housey on Sundays to have it at and the cards they had were made of leather and the numbers were stamped into them or the letters were stamped into them and you just cross them off with chalk. And then eventually they had to put holes in the bits of leather because people were taking the leather cards home to be their shoes. shoes. They staged plays. There was uh, recitals, plays. There was a famous school play there. They did the Pipe Piper of Hamlet. And he's dead now. A man called Pepsi Hunt was the rat. And he was told to do one thing. Don't look at the lads at the back. So he came on, he looked at the lads at the back and fell off the stage and was injured. <laughs> well, there was a radio there and, and with an awful lot of radios, as you probably notice, sometimes you go to turn on the radio and you touch the panel or something, if it's a mains radio, and you get a little, uh, little sliver, sliver of a shock. It's just a little, little buzz. Yeah. And there was one of those there, but um, the funny thing happens uh, on the way to the door, because if you line up a, a line of people, each holding hands from the ra radio to the door, Someone comes in the door, the person at the door shakes their hand, the person at the other end touches the little buzz thing, yeah. and a very significant electric shock is delivered to the person, <laughs> to the person coming in the door. You see, we, 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 we did a lot of science in those days, like because you could do science, it wasn't yeah. electronic, you yeah. know, you bits. Practical stuff. I lived in, in 30, 34 there, and Brian Reynolds, my friend, lived in 35 over the cleaners, so it's over the cleaners now. And I li we lived over the what's now the credit union. And um, uh, Brian, we had those radios, you know, the old, the old radio, and they had a pickup thing at the back where you could buy, instead of buying a record player, you bought a pickup, just a turntable, and you plug mm. it into the back of the radio and use the radio as a, an amplifier. They were very popular in my day. But Brian thought of a thing with an earphone and an earphone into the back of the radio, the two pickup channels connected, mm. and you had an intercom between the two houses, and we used to do uh, Christmas quizzes and all sorts of stuff, yeah. <laughs> So after Sally Noggin, then um, the corporation focused further south on the area um, around Lachlanstown that was to become, you know, all these all these new areas in, in Ballybrack. So we have um, there's some lovely records in Tom's directory, which is a, a document that can tell you who was living where. So we have some lovely records uh, for Dale View, for example, where we can see in 1950 there are 28 small cottages for sale in Daleview, uh, four pounds, 10 shillings each, so a bargain. It was very countryish then, you know, I mean, the bulk of the people that I knew, their, their parents were either, they were gardeners. You know, about, I think it was 20 or 30 gardeners lived in Daleview. They were gardeners to the big houses, and a lot of their wives worked as cooks in the big houses. Ballybrack was serves in the big houses in Cologne. And here, uh, when we came from here across to Ballycorus, Tully Church, <clears throat> that was virtually all fields. I mean, there was the odd building on it and the road over there and that sort of stuff. But in the summer holidays, we set out in the morning and we could go up to Ballycorus, down to the beach. We used to collect a fella's dog and bring it, bring, bring it with us and send him home when we got home. But like, this was your playground. <clears throat> the whole place was your playground. Uh, another place we used to go was where uh, Kilbogget Park is now. That was the corporation dump. So we would raid that to get wheels off prams to make uh, go-karts. And the race down the hills here, but go-karts are down there with you. My, my mother had a, had a paper shop, so papers and sweets, and you could order toys for Christmas out of a catalogue they'd be got. Mm -hmm. And we used to get 
Baskwell's Cakes, Baskwell family are still in Dunleary. Uh, they, they, they were a, a bakery and they made posh cake, what I'd call posh cakes, you know, individual cakes and bigger mm -hmm. cakes. And we had a section reserved at the end of the shop for that. And yes, they used yeah, to come yeah. and deliver them. Yeah. And the other thing my mother, my mother always said, um, uh, the customer is always right. Now that that's a motto for anyone who's running a business, unless they try to beat you up or something. But they're, you know, if they're rude around, you have to put up with this rubbish. Mm. Now the customer is always right. And the second thing she said was, "Keep your mouth shut." And the reason for that was that Ballybrack Village, Killiney Village, and Lachlanstown Village were all the one genealogical area. Mm -hmm. area. And if someone came in and said, "Ah, oh, you're one down there," she's she given out to me and all this. So I'm going, "You know what she did?" And you'd be nodding your head sympathetically. You see, and the next day. Her cousin would come up and say, "I hear you talk your own science. <laughs> what are you doing?" <laughs> yeah, you know. So that, that was good advice. Yeah. Keep your mouth shut. Yeah. The population was growing. You know, as we moved into, as we moved out of the fifties and into the sixties, the population was growing even more. So the boom really only hit in the late sixties, early seventies. That's when everything started off. Dunley right then always did generally have work. Do you know what I mean? Available relatively to other counties, you know, in Ireland. So it, it, the housing was for, for working families. Call-outs were made for people who were interested um, in a house, you know, and they tended to be subscribed. And then there was a response then from the authorities to, 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 to assess that and then to build more. Well, I suppose there was an element, yeah, that, an element of sadness when any place changes. But nostalgia, yeah, okay, I suppose. There used to be people saying, yeah, you came here, you stole our land, you stole our women, you know, we don't want you here. <laughs> but no, you got used to it, and I think it was, it's a good thing. Because I think people who are from the borough should be able to live in that borough. I think it's terrible now that they can't. For two years, we were on the housing list. And at that time, uh, they were building they were building houses in Ireland, lots and lots of houses, local authority houses, to meet a social need. The, the big one that was coming on stream at that time was, was Ballybrack. We had been in a flat in Black Rock in Sea Point, off Sea Point Avenue for about 10 years before that. It was a large house, but there was, I think, eight families living in it. Each floor had a, a bathroom, which you shared with the person on the floor. But there was a great community spirit in the house. Everyone had children. And uh, it was just like one big family, really. It was nice. It was cramped. But as time went on, then uh, the landlord wanted to get people out of the house. So he let the house go to rack and ruin. There was no maintenance after a few years at all. So the hallways were rather dark and dingy places, probably no lock on the back door either, so anyone could just wander in. We had a lot of water damage, it destroyed a lot of our stuff, especially photographs. Now by this time a lot of people had, a few of the families had moved out. They moved to Ballybrack, Oakton, and um, then as Ashlawn was built. So we moved from the flat and crossway, and you know, the, the houses down in Crossway Park, like they were all divided into different flats. So my mother's brother and his wife lived in one of them. Um, um, other neighbours that actually ended up over in Ellen Grove, Bernie, and uh, she lived in another flat. So there was huge excitement, like when they uh, got the key to come up. And we were allowed to pick which house they wanted. So we had a choice of number two or number seven. And my mother and father picked number two. It was horrific. Um, actually, the kids had moved, uh, friends of mine had taken the children because it wasn't fit for habitation. And I had moved in with a friend of mine. And my husband stayed in the house just to keep an eye on the stuff for the last, maybe that happened for two months before we finally got the place. So it was such a relief to be getting the keys to this house. We didn't care that there was nothing in it. So long as we could move in, I had a roof, a dry roof over our heads. I got off the bus over there somewhere and I met Ronnie Wolf, Lord Rester. I said, Ronnie, where is that? She said, I'm sorry to tell you, it's that house there. But from the day I walked in, till this day I love it, always did. 
Loved the area. Oh my God, but it was great. You had horses running around, you had travellers on the other side of the road, the horses. It was just brilliant, but people just got together. They just got together. Everyone was new to the area, excited about having the houses and that. We were the oldest family, so that was kind of, um, you know, they were all coming in with young families where I would have been 12. And I was the youngest in my family, so my sister would have been, you know, 18. We, we got the house there and I remember it was the it was the week that John Lennon was killed. That's how that's how I always remember the date. It was this the beginning of December 1980. And we got the we walked we walked from Monkstown Farm to Sally Noggin and we got the 45A uh, to Ballybrack to see the house. And it was oh, I mean, you know, you could you could spend your whole life trying to get that feeling again of just excitement and newness and 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 you you chase that for your whole life and never feel it. But I felt it as a kid. Well, it was it was different. It was scary, uh, but it was exciting as well to move up to a new estate in Ballybrack. Uh, I'd never even heard of Ballybrack back then. So moving back up, you're making new friends. You're you know exploring a new area. Um, so it is exciting. You're going to go to a new school, you're going to make new friends, you're going to, you know, start living a different life. We all had kids the same age to play with, so I had kids, my friends were my age, the other neighbours' kids were my brother's age, so each family had a family member that was close to age all along the street. Um, we all just played together. There was never any walls between any of the gardens, so we just kind of ran through, did whatever we wanted. Absolutely, gas crack. It was a lot sparser than it is now. <laughs> but my childhood, all I, it's, it's, I just remember a very happy time where we were out playing all the time. The, 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 you know, the roads, there was no cars or anything as such. And so we were, we were out all day as kids. And your neighbours, you knew all your neighbours. People walk in and out of your house, you did no knocking on doors back when we were kids, people just come in. The back garden was a mud bath, like you could, literally couldn't walk into it. Uh, the kids used to go out in their wellingtons, but it, their wellingtons would stay in the ground and they'd have to hoot themselves out of it to come back in. And there was just a wire, a strip of wire separating the houses. And the whole place, like the lorries, everything was still coming in. With the, but as I said, it was still paradise. It was still a building site. That was what was so exciting about it. Like our, our house was finished and we were in 122 Cromwell Fields. It was, a, it was an end of terrace house. It was red brick. Um, and it was, you know, it was just brilliant. Like we, we suddenly, you know, we had two to a bedroom. We were living with my granny, we were all kind of cramped into one room. And uh, and and the man who moved us in, he lived in Lambe and he um, he was a removals man and he had long hair and we thought he looked like uh, Francis Rossi from from Status Quo. And I think they called him Status Quo in on the round. And uh, my dad said, yeah, that's uh, the guy from Status Quo who's <laughs> moving us in. He does a bit of removals on the side. I got here in 1968. I can still remember getting onto the Aer Lingus airplane. And the stewardess said halfway through the trip, she says, do you mind if I sit next to you during the trip? Remember now, I'm 27 years old and beautiful stewardess is there. And she said, I said, uh, sure, come on. And there was only 11 people on the 707 plane coming to Ireland in August of 1968. I think the first thing I remember is looking out the front window of our house in Shangana Vale and seeing all across the street is where Cherrywood is being built now. Seeing nothing but cows in, um, in the fields there. That was called Galvin's Land. Yeah. And there was cows all over the places. And I remember that. I remember, especially at nighttime, the uh, sodium vapor lights on the, it was called the Dublin Bray Road then, now it's called the N11. 
and it was a beautiful color at nights because it was sort of like misty at night. And the sodium is yellow, of course, and uh, and it, it just gave a nice flavor to the to the whole area there. Shopping wise, we walked over to Kalani Shopping Centre. There was nothing, or up to Morphy's in the village, but there wasn't much of a difference between both. Uh, you'd see a trail of prams and go push chairs being brought over into Kalani Shopping Centre and everyone coming back with their bags of shopping because there was nothing, literally nothing here at all. So even when you came up here, there was no shops. The only shop that there was at the time was a big, huge blue uh, van at the top of Ashton called Mr. Gray's Shop Van, and he sold everything. And then Kalani Shopping Centre was built not long after we arrived. And I remember my mother like taking myself and my sister. Um, and then obviously when my brother came along and in the pram, like we would have all had big silver cross prams at that stage or, you know, they were big hefty buggies, not like the ones that are out now. And you'd walk up to Kleine Shopping Centre, but there'd be hundreds of people like walking up that way, like to do your shopping in Williams's, H. Williams's was up there. Then the, the library, the mobile library, that's where we got our books from. And it parked in Ballybrack Village on Wyattville Road. And I remember the first day that pulled up there and me and a bunch of friends, we went up and we were rocking, rocking the library, just <laughs> pushing it back and forward like that. There was about 10 of us. The, thing, and the books have fallen off the shelves and everything. And the librarian came out to us and she said, um, it's brilliant. She just said like, that looks like a lot of fun. But what, what's in here? It's even more fun. And we went in and she was right, you know, and we discovered all these books and everything. And we, like, the idea that you can, I can take this and then like, you know, bring it home and then bring it back whenever I want. No, no, you have to bring it back within four weeks. The excitement of that, you know? And um, so, so the books came from vans, the groceries came from vans, uh, the videos, the first video van, Jer Kelly. Remember Jer Kelly coming around? There was no extra vision in those days. Uh, and Jer had this van and he had these crates with, with movies in them. Like, you know, like, you know, there were movies that were in the cinema like five years ago, but they felt new because nobody had seen them since. And uh, it was brilliant, you know, he would just drive around and dad would go out and he'd come back in with something like The Cat from Outer Space or Battlestar Galactica or some film you'd seen years and years earlier. Uh, but everything, everything was vans and we were, it was like we were waiting for somebody to build to build the community, you know, there was like, they, they built the houses, but we had to wait for things like a church, a school. You know, it, it was like, put the houses there and the rest will follow. That was that was the, the attitude then. I used to think I could stand at the door on a Friday with my wages and hand them out because there was the milkman, there was the bread man, there was a the vegetable person, there was a the paper woman coming and, I can't remember what else, but literally you stood at the door on a Friday evening and, and the coal, of course, the coal man, and handed out the money. Uh, Ina Stores, to which Tony Ram was, was the closest shop, and it's only like, you know, whatever, half a kilometre away, but that just seemed like miles and miles away when we were kids. Well, it was under the arch at Ina Court, and it was a godsend. Everyone went to Tony's. It wasn't as big as this room here. Little storeroom at the back. He had premises upstairs where he used to start, have a storeroom. But everyone knew Tony. You could, if, you, if you hadn't got a few bob, you could go to Tony, you know. It was all that kind of, he was that kind of a person. Badly, he badly missed, really is, yeah. The supermarket was built right behind our house, so there was great excitement watching that coming up and waiting and waiting for it to open. So that was a big day when the supermarket opened. Mm. But it changed a few times, but it didn't matter, it was there. Mm. It was our, our supermarket and we were very happy with it. So a big part of the community back then, in my estate, there was a chipper van, um, Bert ran a chipper van. And I remember uh, Junger worked in it as well, uh, Francis Young. And we'd just hang around there and I'd have, I was after getting a, big, a ghetto blaster back in the time, playing tapes, no CDs or no um, MP3s back then, you know. So tapes and blasting out of it and you'd hang around the chipper. Now you wouldn't have had much money, you'd be scabbing a few chips off, off Younger or whatever it was, you know. 
and you just hang around there and just walk around the estates. And we did, we just walked around um, down to the beach. We were very lucky to have uh, a beach as an amenity in, in the local area. You could walk and beautiful views around the area as well. So we walked around the estates. I remember being a kid and, you know, I'd go out with, you know, Chrissy Byrne or Jason Dawn or Mark McCarthy, any of my friends at that age. And we just walk, like we just walk for hours and we weren't going anywhere. We had nothing to do. We just sort of, let's walk to Goo Bays as it was then. We'd just walk to Goo Bays. We'd get to Goo Bays, nobody had any money. And then we'd just walk all the way back to Cromlech again. Or we'd walk down to Kleiny Beach and throw stones into the sea and walk back. And it was that thing of just allowing yourself to be bored. And I think kids now, they, they probably need a lot more mental stimulation than kids did back then. That was, a, that was a dump site in what is Kilbogas now. And it's the mid 70s. I don't know how long it was. There. We were there. I remember as five and six year old playing on us and I don't know what, I had my hands in. But there was big muck heaps that we used to just climb up and roll around and it was just a place all the kids used to go up and play. The dump was just behind us here. And it was to me, it was like this, this, you had to go up this big hill. And then when you got to the top of the hill, it was just, from my recollection, it was just washing machines, muck piles, seagulls, um, as far as the eye could see. Um, we weren't really allowed to play up there, although we, we did go up once or twice. But probably the most memorable me for the dump is snow days. Like literally every, There'd be thousands of people around there with whatever they could find. Uh, for me, it was the probably a biscuit tin lid or a breakfast tray or a breadboard from the you know the bread deliveries, and we just spent hours and hours just coming down, coming down the hill from the top to the bottom. Dad was just a character. I think he was barred for most pubs for singing, you know. And the best thing about me dad was he had a fantastic voice but he didn't know any of the words, so he used to make up his own words. So the only time he was really good was, my ma was fantastic at the words, but she had no voice. So she used to be singing, prompting him, you know what I mean, giving him all the words. But I remember him singing at my sister's wedding, the wheels of Atten Roy, you know, it's like, but he was convinced it was the wheels of Atten Roy. But uh, him and Bobby Kane, they were two characters. Bobby um, passed away very young, he was very young, but he was the joker. It's Christmas time, they went around, collected two pounds back then, and that was huge, so they, hired, I don't know whether they got it for nothing or they bought the, the travellers a few drinks or whatever, horse and cart and they dressed up as Santi and, they, and they'd come down with the lucky bags and the little toy and you were delighted with that because we didn't have much money back then, a little sweet and you know, but them coming down on the horse and cart twisted and all the kids jumping on it and everything else. Health and safety was not around, it wasn't invented back then. I was still going to school in Dalkey uh, for about a year or two years after I'd moved to Ballybreck, I'd go down for the train every morning in Kalini. And my teacher at the time in Dawkey moved, got a job in Ballybreck teaching in the prefabs. Um, and I moved up when he moved up with him. So that's when I moved to school into Ballybreck. She kept us in school in Dunleary for the first a uh, little while, but obviously like that, it was unsustainable trying to get from Ballybrack to Dunleary. And then we went to St. John's across the road. St. John's school was originally there. So the boys school was originally, that's the old building that's still there now. And when we moved up, there was prefabs built and there was the girls school. So uh, at the time when I went to the girls school, I'm nearly sure there was probably about 40 odd girls in our class. And there probably would have been the same in the boys as well. And uh, because there was no other school as such in Ballybrack. And then Column Kills then went on to be built as well. I went to school of Column Kills, it was literally 30 seconds across the road there. And then Cabin Teeley Community School. Uh, I was in Column Kills and then I went to Lawrence's. I have a vague memory of being in the prefabs and I remember Mrs. Dalton was my first teacher and I had a little crush on her. Yeah, the school, the school was brilliant. Colin Gould is actually brilliant. Like teachers like Miss Holland and, and Miss Crownham would have had a huge effect on me, a huge positive uh, influence on me and treated me completely normal. And as why wouldn't they? They're teachers like uh, Miss Rohan actually as well during my kind of communion year. 
like when I went to school, I used to go around uh, up until first class. I used to go around in a kind of little red cart. Um, I didn't know I was, I suppose I didn't know I was disabled in a way. Um, and the idea of a wheelchair probably subconsciously confirmed that I was. And I was always delaying using a chair for everyday use. So I was using a little red cart or uh, people might remember me growing up in a little tricycle. I had a little a three-wheeler bike and I used to bring them to school. But it was Miss Rohan because I, I don't know, I got, she, she was a great, great influence. She was a real mammy figure. And I remember her having a discussion with me about perhaps transitioning into a wheelchair um, for, for school. And I just remember her taking me aside and having conversations before actually doing it. Um, and I remember then doing it and I remember being taller than the rest of the kids at the tables and stuff. And I thought, geez, this is brilliant. Um, and, and the kids were kind of looking up to me then. So the school is in existence in 74. Uh, started off uh, with prefabs and, um, you know, body back as it exists now probably looked very, very different. A lot of the houses weren't built. And the school has sort of grown, grew in the early, sort of mid 70s in line with the, the rate of growth in the area. So it started off with a couple of prefabs in 74, uh, rapidly grew, and then a build started in late 75. And so the senior school was built. We're sitting in the senior school now. This was built in 75. Between 40 and 60 children enrolled originally, and uh, it grew very rapidly after that. So in the space of five or six years, you went from 40 to nearly 1,000. Yeah, the prefabs were, were different, all right. Um, they were a makeshift, a makeshift school. I mean, we were kids, we were young kids. We didn't mind the conditions there now at the, mo at the time. And I remember one thing actually funny that was happening back then that we'd been in early one day and the headmaster called myself, Bunker Farrell and Shadow of Connor out. And we thought we'd done something wrong. And he gave us a hurley each. And he had a he had a waste bin in his in his hand, and he said, "Lads, come on around the back of the, the prefab here." And we didn't know where he was going with this, so uh, he tipped out the waste bin, and out popped three mice. So we had to chase the three mice around with the Hurleys <laughs> to make sure they didn't come back again. But like everybody that was in Ballybrack at that time, kind of like. All the girls and boys, like they were kind of all my age group, like everybody on our road nearly had three or four kids and we were all the same age as me. So I'm 54, my sister's 51, my brother's 48. So like every family nearly had three or four kids that were all in and around the same age. So there was great, everybody knew everybody, everybody played together. Like there was no such thing as being in on devices, like you were out playing nobody really had an awful lot but whatever we had we all played together we make houses you know out of uh, grass cuttings and you'd play in the summer like that but even on the road we used to play tip the can we used to play rounders just anything like hide and go seek or we'd build a go-kart um they were great just building a go-kart out of absolute nothing like do you know what i mean but even the school used to give you the broken chairs and then you'd find a, a wheel from a broken buggy or, you know, a plank of wood. And, like, these were just, like, you were never bored. Ever bored. But I remember our go-kart. Our go-kart had three chairs on it. And then we had a rope, like a steering wheel for the rope. Like, I mean, you just spent hours going around. Like, there was never any. Uh, I'm from Donegal originally. My sister lived on Churchview Road. She, she bought a house there in 1980. And I used to come on my holidays to Ballybrack. So my first uh, memory of Ballybrack uh, was staying with my sister as a 15, 16 year old, having a wee bit of freedom, uh, going down to Goobays in the morning and whatever, and actually played football with a gang of lads down around here. So uh, I do go back a good bit in Ballybrack as a kid. I always say that, the, you know, my memory of my childhood growing up in Ballybrack was you stepped out of the house you, you know, early in the morning, like houses were just emptied out in those days. You know, you, the, our mother would open the door at nine o'clock and like, see you later. And we'd go off. You didn't know whether you were going to get, you know, a, a punch in the face, uh, score the winner in a, a, a match up in, you know, Lambay or wherever you went, uh, 
find a fiver, you know, get offered money to mow somebody's garden. Anything could happen in that day. So it was just, it was just a great childhood, you know. It was a brilliant place to live. So we, we, yeah, he was well known because even now to this day, as soon as I say my name, somebody always says, where's your dad, Dermot my ring? Um, which is kind of nice. Um, he got involved in the whole community with, with everything. Communions, Christians, confirmations, anything that was going on, football, basketball blitz, anything, he was all, he was there. Myself and my younger sister Tara more so would help him in the evenings, um, putting the wedding albums together. So it would be like a conveyor belt. So my dad would do one thing and he'd flip the photograph over and then I would have to get these stickers and then stick the photograph to the frame and then flip it over and then Tara would put it into the album and then pass it back to my dad and he'd have gloves on or a cloth and he'd be polishing the, making everything perfect, you know. So it was great because he always had us involved in his work and sometimes he would bring us to hold the light meter or the flash or just to, to help out or Especially if it was communion or confirmation, you'd have to stand and take the name so he'd know which negative number. He'd say, Linda, the next one is negative, starts at two, and the family surname, and so on and so forth. After sixth class in the prefabs, uh, we had to decide which schools we were going to. And my friends were going to St. Lawrence's, so that's where I was going. I was going to go to St. Lawrence's and this was a new big bad world, St. Lawrence's, because we'd heard all about it and people going to it and that. And I was very timid and shy back then and I was a bit scared, but uh, excited as well. They, they, the Archbishop of Dublin asked the Marianist to come to Ireland and start a school, an all boys school. And we did. And the school was originally called, and it was on the pin board, on the, not the nose, the big billboard down there at the, at the front of the school there on the uh, N11 now. Um, it said Marianist College. So the school originally was called Marianist College. Then the Archbishop says, no, nah, we want it to be called after the first Archbishop of Dublin, St. Lawrence O'Toole. And it was all boys. And the boys started down in the prefabs, okay? And when I got here, the prefabs were, uh, only three of them were built. Sorry, only two of them were built. And then they built the third and fourth when I got here. And it was all boys. Um, there was uh, three teachers. Uh, yeah, three teachers. And Mr. Heaney, Mr. McGinnis, and Mr. Byrne. Okay, and then, oh, Mr. Garrity. And in 1973, the girls came. And the boys loved that. And they just loved that. <laughs> and actually, the girls liked it too. And they never looked back. They never looked back. It was very good having girls and boys together. Well, uh, one of the draws for Lawrence's for me was the no uniforms back in the day. That was, I mean, very few schools were giving you the no uniform option. So that was kind of why I wanted to go there, you know. And again, I had a great time there. School was very good. Um, both schools I went to, I just, most of the teachers were great. The, the friends again, like the people you miss. It was a good, it was a good time to grow up, you know. <laughs> the brothers in Lawrence's were, uh, were, were liberal, uh, you know, and, and not politically liberal. They were just, you know, they were, I remember, I remember being in religion class in first year and uh, kids telling brother Fred that they didn't believe in God. And he went, hey, that's okay. You know, we, religion wasn't, wasn't force fed to us if you believed it. Uh, it was fine if you didn't, that was fine as well. And um, I remember those discos, I, you know, th some of those discos, it was like the last days of the Roman Empire, <laughs> like, you know. And then on Monday, Brother Joe would say over the intercom, you know, there was trouble at the disco on Friday night. Uh, if this keeps up, there'll be no more discos. And it was like, what? <laughs> we, you know, I mean, that's liberal, like, you know. The discos ended in the 80s, early 80s, because 
Ireland was changing and nobody really knew how to change with what was going on. The, the students, the young people, it was just chaos. Society was, I think, was in a chaotic state then. And nobody really knew how to, to uh, work with what was going on. It was so difficult. And students, students just, uh, students started to get freedom. And they started to be themselves. And they just went a little bit overboard sometimes. And sometimes the, uh, the discos went overboard. The students went overboard in the discos. And it wasn't safe. It was all right. I wasn't great academically, but I was only in school for the social life, you know. Um, I wasn't in serious trouble in school, so I never got the brunt of Mr. McGuinness to, like, you know, when it comes to being bold or so, and so to speak. But uh, I had him for maths in, in fourth year. And Take Mr. McGuinness as a character. Um, he came across as a very gruff, her, her, a man, okay, and I remember the story once where kids were walking down the hallway and somebody pretended to be Mr. McGinnis and the kids were so scared and it wasn't Mr. McGinnis, it was one of the students. Mr. McGinnis had his own unique ways of uh, dealing with people. Uh, Mr. McGinnis liked to play golf, okay, and he would, uh, if you if you were bad during school time, he would be playing golf after school and he'd hit the golf ball and he'd go 100 meters. You had to chase the golf ball and go find a golf ball and come back again. <laughs> um, but he cared about the students, you know. He's a tough man and the students, I think, liked him. I think because they knew where they were with him. But it wasn't until I became a teenager that I kind of went further afield from our road because you didn't have to go anywhere else you know and obviously you weren't let either you know what I mean like if you had to be in sight of your mother and if you weren't in sight of your mother you had to be in sight of your friends your your neighbor's mother do you know what I mean and back in that day you were as afraid of your neighbor you know like of your friend's mom as you were of your own mother because they had as much right to give out to you as your own mother did, like that's the way it was. Well, I felt back in the day, do you know what I mean? Back in the day, Jesus. Sarah was a hundred here. I was, uh, I arrived up here with my mother on the Saturday morning. I think it was the second day they'd opened and bought a pub. And uh, the start work knocked it, we pulled up. The pub was closed at the time, it was the Ramblers restaurant around the corner. And uh, pulled up with my mother, parked the car, nobody around, so I said, I better knock at the door. Or my mother said, because uh, I was kind of uh, nervous as, as a 16-year-old was them days. And knocked at the door, and I remember distinctly Nola Dow would answer the door with a growl. <laughs> but I said, I'm here to see Tom and John Brady. And uh, came back to the door. He didn't open the door. He went back and found out and invited me in. And it all started then. They owned the Diogo here at the time, John and Tom. And... Uh, they decided there was a cousin of mine up here at the time as well, started with me the night before actually, and uh, John said he'd take him because he was more senior, he'd worked in the bar business, I was only a novice, I was only in it for a while up in the village years ago in Ramwood, and uh, said I'd keep, Tom said he'd keep me in the Ramblers. That's where it all started in 83. Say when I first started kind of, like when I was first allowed out as such, the U Club like would have been a big thing. And at the time, it was before uh, Ballybrack Community or the football club was built. So the U Club was in St. Lawrence's College. And uh, the likes, I always remember the likes of Neil Byrne, Cali, uh, Mr. Treadgold, uh, Mr. Brown. They were all Mr. and Mrs. Like, whatever else back in the day. They were all a big part of the community that kind of helped the youth um, come together and it helps you get uh, Ballybrack Football Club built that was used not only for the football club but to be used like for the U club and everything else. Football 
in the area was uh, a big thing. There was nothing really, no amenities uh, back in the area when I moved up to Ballybrack, these new estates popping up. So, you know, to be involved in the local football club was the big thing. I first signed for Ballybrack, it was Jim McGlone who came knocking on my door. And I suppose, you know, when new estates are popping up, you need to uh, fill your teams up with, with new players, uh, make your team better. So he came around, uh, knocked on the door with the, the papers to, to sign for Ballybrack, and I jumped at the opportunity. But Jim McGlone, to me, looking at him, he was, he was like a character, uh, a football manager, say like the, the likes of Ron Atkinson, right? The sheepskin coat, the cigar in his mouth, uh, had all the talk, had the big car, you know? And uh, yeah, he was, it was an absolute character. Um, now, unfortunately, Jim's not with us any longer, um, but uh, yeah, I remember him fondly. And he was a great uh, Shamrock Rover supporter as well. You know, there were a lot of other characters. My own father um, managed a team in Ballybreck. So these people coming into the area, these are all working class people. And like you had, my uncle was, was doing it as well. Noel Merrigan, Willie Bourne, Matt Mooney, Joe Flanagan, um, Danny Smith, all those people, you know, just giving a dig out. That's what they're doing. But they're helping the community at the same time doing that. And after the matches, I remember after the matches, there'd be post-mortems, they'd go up to the Igo after the matches and their wives and the, the wags of Ballybrack would be there as well. But it'd be all the men walk, sitting around one table discussing the football and all the women would be around the other table. And that's where friend, friendships were formed, new friendships. And those people, you know, still have those friendships to this day, all because of the football in Ballybrack. Sitting where did you I'm sure, I mean, they were, they like the two boys off the Muppet Show. They used to be there in the morning on the seats, you know. But Sid was great in the bad times when I was here and things were quiet. Sid was the first person that used to come in in the morning and we'd have a cup of coffee. He was off the drink at the time and he used to go over and we'd two of us would have a latte and an old scroll about who it was and who was this and who he was related and who he wasn't related. Then you're going, oh, all right, I didn't know that. But he, great, great people like Jimmy McElroy. Jimmy Swan. Jimmy Swan was probably the big character of Valley Black years ago since we came here especially. He would have best man to sell lottery tickets ever knew. We could go to anybody in the pub and name off their four or five numbers and you're kind of looking at him. How can you remember that? Even when he got sick, like he was still the same, you know? One of the one of the gents, the true gents. Every summer Spanish students would arrive and there must have been there must have been like three or four hundred. Maybe, maybe I'm, you know, remembering that incorrectly. But I just remember being just overrun with with Spaniards. I think, I think, you know, there were probably more Spaniards than Irish people in Valley Frank in those days. And people had them everywhere, like in their spare rooms and everything. You know, some families would take two or three. And you know, when it came to the summertime and all the students came, you know, because like. I think it was Linda Drum that used to bring in the students and the students used to go to Lawrence's College and they were all tanned and spoke this like exotic language, you know what I mean? And we all wanted to go out with one of them, you know what I mean? Or you would chase them around and, but, and we all hung around in gangs like wherever they were, um, you know, we'd all be there. So they were a, a huge, like that was a huge part of every summer. Like you'd be looking forward to the Spanish students coming over. They used to come for four weeks. Again, it, it's kind of hard to, to tell you to tell young people or to get the message across about how you know monocultural we were at the time you know we didn't have uh, any immigrant population in Ireland you know Ireland was in those days just purely a purely white purely Irish country you know so suddenly having this influx of of Spanish people, like the glamour of it. It was just, and, and people would kind of, kids would like wait for their Spanish student to come home from school. They'd wait up the road and they'd walk home with the Spanish student. Everybody's so proud. And I remember there was one kid stayed around the corner from us and his name was, his name was uh, Juanito. A brilliant footballer, you know, and he had, he had the, because a lot of them were from quite wealthy families, you know, he had brilliant clothes, all the Benetton clothes, you know, and. Uh, the watch, big gold watch, and he, and he smelled uh, of this thing, which I found out sub subsequently was called Nanuko. And I, I still don't really know what Nanuko is. I think it might be some kind of bath oil. Uh, but Ballybrack, this, 
this cloud of Nanuko hung over Ballybrack for the entire summer. It's all you could smell. And this, I, I, think, this, I think the Spanish students were, would, you know, I, I hope they weren't scarred by the experience of living among us, but it was very, it must have been very, very intense for them, you know, because people were so interested in them. Um, having had no exposure to, to people from other countries. And I remember uh, we used to play football with them. And, you know, two or three of them were walking by and we we're, were playing one of those matches that started at two o'clock and was still going at nine in the evening. And none of the players who started at two are still on the pitch. Everybody, people come and go and we'll have him and you have him. And, and then you, the, the Spaniards would come over and they'd say, uh, can we play, you know, and they'd join in. And, and they'd have these sort of silky skills, like, you know, and people with silky skills didn't, didn't last long in Ballybrack, you know, so uh, one or two step overs they did, and then someone would just go in two-footed, absolutely mill them ever. <laughs> they'd limp off, limp off to the disco <laughs> wherever they were going at night with this trail of Nanuko behind them. <laughs> From 1990 onwards, Ireland completely changed. Before that, it was quite grim and bleak, and you know there was huge unemployment here in the 80s, like huge unemployment, and that went from youth to adults as well. Like there was a lot of parents like that didn't have jobs either because there was so few jobs, you know. And inflation was huge, and it just it Ireland in the 80s, you know just wasn't a great place to be as such, you know what I mean? So. Of course, there was, there, there was a darker side to life as, as there is everywhere. Um, you know, two things, I suppose, drugs and unemployment um, scarred Ballybrack like, you know, lo like they did lots of communities. Um, the unemployment thing was you know, I remember being a teenager and just that was like a, a kind of a shadow on the on, on the x-ray of your being. That's what it felt like to me, the, this sense that uh, you, you were going through school and if you were going to have a job at the end of it, you were, you know, you were going to have to emigrate. And, you know, I had a real sense of that as a sort of 15, 16 year old um, that, you know, even, even if you're from a close family, you're probably going to be saying goodbye to them one day. Um, the you know unemployment was very much part of life in Ballybrack. I was lucky that my dad had a job, but lots of my friends, their fathers were unemployed, and I saw what that did to their their family unit, to their homes, their sense of themselves. Um, and yeah, and you know that that was kind of very much it sort of hung over your life like a shadow, you know, that just the sense that w whatever you were doing in school, it wasn't going to be enough that you were, you know, you, you were going to get a job in a factory here. And if you weren't that lucky, you were probably going to have to go away. If you wanted to get on, you know, England was really the place to go or America, Germany. They were, you know, and nearly every second person you knew was emigrating. You know, we used to go to the Leslie, look out the window and look at that ceiling because at the time the boat used to go from Dunleary to Hollyhead and you'd look out there and, you know, every week the Leslie became, you know, there was less and less people because more and more people, were, instead of going to the Leslie, were actually going on the boat to go to England. Like, So when I left Lawrence's, I came out of Lawrence's and there weren't more any opportunities then for people. Like, I was from a working class area, I wasn't going to get the chance to go to college and there was pretty much no work back in the 80s back then. So a lot of people just basically jumped on the boat to England, went over to London, got a job working on the sites in London. And that's basically what I did. Um, did that for a couple of years. And always want, didn't want to leave Ireland, but I had to, had to go over. But it was ex exciting as well. You know, you're just going out into a new life. You're 18 years of age, 19 years of age, and you're going over. Uh, exploring a new country, but my heart was in Ireland and Ballybrack. Even, even the normality of kind of growing up, there was always like, the lads are robbing orchards, I was robbing orchards. I remember one time I jumped up on a wall out of my chair to, to rob some apples and I fell and I had to get a, a neighbour to pick me up 
not knowing and then him kind of wondering what were you doing up in the wall you know growing up in whether it be Wideville had great friends up there the O'Sullivans um, the Mars the Lacey's um, the Glendons the Quinlan's they were like growing up in Wideville prob- Wideville was probably the starting point of the confidence of not really being different so to speak and then kind of evolving into secondary school and always being around Ashland you know Halloween or I wasn't a huge fan of Halloween but still I, the point being is that I participated in everything that I could there was never no there was never no limits you know I got moved over to Valley back over here but we only have the center here in the mornings which is great but there was a lack there was a piece missing then so for older people so I'm working with a lot of older people now I say older people they're probably same age as me they'll kill me if they hear this but um we do chair exercises for the over 55s there's craft groups here and um, they do blankets for stillborn babies they do the shoebox appeal they want to give back so uh, it's lovely uh, we have an art group that's doing a pop-up shop. They are retired people that just want a space to get to. You know, they could do it at home, but it's not. They have a tutor in here, and, and it's a community in themselves. There, there have been difficulties over the years, uh, socially, economically, educationally, but I generally have seen a good improvement over the years. Um, the homeschool liaison scheme came in in the 90s, and I think that's had a lot to do with uh, making the school more accessible to parents and making it more community based. Well to me it's the best place you could live. It's 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 unique, it's big, it's um it's got its little quirks, you, you know, but it's there's a lot of community in Bally Bay. I find community of community is something that I never really thought of before here, but now that I'm in it, you notice how many people are just trying to keep this place going and positive and, and looking out for each other. I, I, I think it's a great community for helping each other. I will stay here as long and continue working here in school as long as my health keeps up, as long as I don't go crazy, <laughs> as long as I'm wanted, as long as I feel that I'm contributing, and most important is being happy. If I'm not happy, you know, I want, to, I want to be a happy person. And that's what I try to teach the students. That's the most important thing in a person's life, to be happy. And happiness does not mean I have a, a pocket full of money. Like it doesn't seem like 30, what, 40 years, nearly is 40 years, it wouldn't be far off 40 years, 39 years, around the general area like always been. But I have to say out of all, the and no disrespect to any other Bakers Corner or anywhere else, Valley Brack is probably I've felt more comfortable than anywhere else. Obviously that's why I've ended up so long here, but good people were always there for you. Like I mean there were if there was a problem and something happened, there was always somebody behind you. Which means a lot like at the back of the day. I think we're lucky to be living here. We've the sea, we've the country, we've everything. You know, everything. I mean it's, it's Kalini's only down the road and people go mad to go to Kalini, to come out from everywhere. And then we have their stone tour, we have Wicklow, you know, we're, we're lucky. Ballybrack is, like, it has given me, um, you know, someone growing up with a disability in a wheelchair. Um, it's given me the ability to be myself um, because nobody has battered an eyelid. Nobody has said, you can't do this, you can't do that. Um, you know, it's, it's given me the, the ability to be myself and to grow. Home again. This is my 
home, and I've been away for far too long from my home. Coming back now, the bad feelings gone from my home, where the love is in my home again. And here I'll stay for the rest of my days. This is my home